Good morning, everybody. We're so glad that you're here with us. Uh, if you're a guest this morning, we just want to say especially thanks so much for being here with us, uh, joining us for worship. If you're watching online, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, hey, if you're a guest, there's a few things that you might want to know about here uh, at Crosswind. We do have Crosswind kids available, so if you have a kid that's fifth grade and below, uh, and you want them to hang out on their own, and you want to just worship by yourself, you uh, and your family, that'd be great. You can take them down this orange hallway into the back. They have their own worship service. They're going to be in small groups with kids their own age, and they get to hear about Jesus uh, just in a way that they can better understand it. We've got trained and screen volunteers that are excited to hang out with your kiddos this morning, so you can take them back there to Crosswind Kids. Uh, if you're a mom and you have a little one that you want to keep close this morning, this morning that's perfectly fine too. Uh, we do have the mom room back here in the corner that you can use, so if you need a little bit of privacy, uh, you can go back there, and we're live streaming the service, so you're not going to miss anything at all, so please use that this morning as well. And we also have the starting point room over here in this corner. Uh, if you're new to Crosswind and you want to know anything more uh, about what we're about, what we are, if you want to meet somebody on staff, meet some elders, uh, you can do that back there. If you have any questions about the service, you just want to pray with somebody, um, whatever that is, that you can do that after the service uh, right back there in the starting point room. Uh, also, if you're a regular attender and you came ready to give this morning, thanks so much. Just a reminder, there's boxes in the back um, that you can give in. You can drop a ca cash or a check or anything like that here in the auditorium, or you can give online. Uh, you can go to our church website. You can give there. You can also download the Crosswind Church app, uh, and you can give there as well. So if you came ready to do that, thanks so much again uh, for, for that. Hey, you see this can of sweet potatoes. We talked about it a little bit last week, but it is officially fall. The weather has cooled off. We had some white chicken chili last night for supper, and it was amazing. Soup season is the best season. Um, but that also means it is sweet potato season here at Crosswind Church. Uh, we are the sweet potato church. So if you're new here, uh, we need a lot of these bad boys, okay? The 15-ounce cans of sweet potatoes. We need 1,500 of these, okay? So like Garrett said last week, either 15 people can bring 100 or... 100 people can bring 15, right? Or 200 people can bring seven and a half, you know? I don't know. Um, 15 ounce cans, though, is what we know. We don't need the real big giant cans. We need the 15 ounce cans. Whenever you bring them, you can drop them off right back there in front of our uh, picture station, and we will take those where they need to be. Um, but that is all for me this morning. Thanks so much again for being here. Let's stand and worship together. Amen. Well, good morning, Crosswind. Let's worship together. I'd like to say this first song is kind of a slow burn, but we're going to join together in worship. We're going to praise his name. We're going to speak Jesus over our community. I need no other hiding place. I hope is safe within your name. This we know, this we know, the promise never to forsake, what you began you will sustain, this we know, this we know, I will call upon the Lord, for he strong enough to save. Rise your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. All 
of the heavens and the earth. Announce the fullness of your worth. This we know. This we know. And every enemy will flee as we declare your victory. This we know. This we know. I will call upon the Lord for He alone is strong enough to save.
be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Just 
Every soul held captive by depression, I speak Jesus. Cause your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadow. from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus Shout Jesus from the mountains Jesus the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the dark. The splendor of the King Robed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great. And 
And age to age he stands And time is in his hands Beginning and the end Beginning and the end The Godhead three in one Father, Spirit what heaven's going to sound like, God. We can't wait to see you face to face when we can sing straight to you how great is our God. Voices will join all as one in beautiful harmony as we praise and worship you now and forever. God, we thank you for this little time we can get together as the body of Christ and worship you. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. We are smack dab in the middle uh, of a conversation that we started a few weeks ago talking about the seven deadly sins. And as we mentioned last week and the week before, uh, nowhere in Scripture do we see this actual list 
of seven sins, but throughout church history, uh, theologians have agreed that these sins form what, what one theologian called the cardinal sins, meaning that they lead to other sins. And so we wanted to spend some time talking about them and what Scripture has to say about them, where they might lead us, and uh, ways we can combat them in our lives. And so we've dealt with this list uh, for the last few weeks uh, of the seven deadly sins, pride, sloth, lust, envy, gluttony, greed, and wrath. And, uh, and today we get to talk about envy, uh, which is a unique sin amongst the seven. Envy is unique because um, it carries with it its own punishment. Um, So, for instance, all of the other sins on some level, at least momentarily, have a pleasure that's associated with them. Like, there there seems to be some kind of benefit that comes, at least initially, uh, from engaging in that sin. We know that they all end up leading to destruction and to other things. Uh, But envy doesn't carry with it any kind of benefit. There's no real pleasure that comes from, from having envy take root inside of our hearts. In fact, it leads to this rotting, decaying kind of nastiness that's on the inside of us. It makes us bitter and leads us down a pathway that, that ultimately is going to take us to places uh, that we never, ever, ever wanted to go. And so we get to kind of talk about envy today. And, and to do it just like all of the other sins, we wanted to come up with a, with a definition of envy so that we're all on the same page and we know what we're talking about. And so envy is not like jealousy uh, in the fact that jealousy says that when my neighbor gets the brand new car, we look at it and go, man, I'm jealous of that. I wish I had one like that. Uh, Envy is the next kind of level. It's jealousy to the next level. It's where I don't want a car like that, but it's I want that car, right? I want theirs. It's not just enough for me to want what it is that, you know, something that's like that they have. I want to have what it is that they have. And so the definition of envy that we're going to use today is, is envy is feeling bitter when others have it better. Envy is feeling bitter when others have it better. They look out at what other people have, and, and, and they may have it better than us in whatever way. They may have physical attributes that we desire, a relationship that we desire. Uh, they may have uh, physical items that we desire uh, or, or whatever it may be. That we have, they have something that we want, and because we don't have it, we grow bitter uh, towards them and, and ultimately towards God as well. And so what's going to happen is that as envy kind of takes root in our lives, we begin to get our self-worth from the way that we compare to other people uh, rather than um, how, how we relate to God. So our self-worth is related on how we relate to other people. So what envy does and what it kind of creates in you is because I don't have those other things that everybody else has, I feel bad about myself, and it begins to kind of eat away at us. And to illustrate the pathway that envy puts us on, we're going to read a story from the Old Testament today uh, about a young man named Joseph. Now, Joseph, to, to, to kind of fill you in, if you're not familiar with the the story of the people of Israel. Um, uh, They uh, started uh, with a man named Abraham who was called by God uh, and he was going to be the father of a great nation. And Father Abraham had uh, had a son uh, named Isaac and Isaac had a couple sons, Esau and Jacob. And Jacob would later get renamed Israel by God himself. And so Israel would have 12 sons that would grow up to become the 12 sons tribes of Israel. And one of those sons, in fact, was a man by the name of Joseph. And Joseph was the firstborn son of Jacob or Israel's favorite wife, Rachel. And and so he became the favorite son. And, And as you may be aware, that leads to all sorts of problems. And so we're going to read today uh, from Genesis chapter 37, and we're going to read just, just selected verses. I encourage you to go back and read the rest of the story of, of Jacob and his family because, man, if you ever feel like your family has some dysfunction inside of it, just go check out these guys. Okay, Genesis chapter 37, uh, we're going to pick up beginning in verse 3. 
Now Israel, which is, which is Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. That, that they hated him because, because their father like, like loved him more. He, he, he kind of leaned in Joseph's direction more than other, uh, of the other boys. And, and so I don't know what this robe is. We, we kind of have some debate about what exactly this multicolored robe, whether it was a technicolor dream coat or whatever. I'm not entirely sure what it was that Joseph had, but it was something that set him apart from the rest of his brothers, and it was a reminder to his brothers that Joseph had something that they didn't have, that, that their father had kind, of, had kind of bestowed this privilege upon Joseph, and they couldn't stand it. So much so, it says they couldn't even say a kind word about him. The, the, the way that the, the Hebrew there is worded is, is they couldn't say shalom to him. They couldn't say peace to him, meaning... They didn't want anything good for Joseph at all. I, I think about that. I think about how misplaced that is. They're, they're frustrated with Joseph because, because their father, you know, kind of gave them some privilege that he didn't give them. And then I got to thinking, like, like it, it's kind of that way too with us. When someone gets something that, that we wanted, that, that now we can't have, uh, don't we naturally kind of instinctively, if, if we allow envy to kind of get inside of us, don't we kind of, kind of make excuses as to why they got it and we didn't get it and, and, and why it's kind of their fault that they got those things? I, think about it this way. Like, about it this way. When you're at work and, and someone uh, you know, gets that promotion ahead of you that you were wanting and you thought you maybe deserved, it, you know, it's not enough for you to go, man, you know what, good for them. No, what you go is, listen, they're a brown noser, right? And, and, and you think things like, you know what, they, they're probably, they probably, you know, have some dirt on the boss, and that's why he promoted them, you know? Or, or they're sleeping with the boss, and that's why they got to do what they did. Or you know what, they went to, they went to school together, or their family, right? It's nepotism at, at its worst, or whatever it may be. And you come up with, hey, you know what, it's not because they might have deserved it before me. It's, it's, because, it's because of some kind of privilege that they got from someone else. And we kind of tear them down. We can't speak a good word about them. When I was in uh, a kid growing up, actually a teenager, uh, and I was playing baseball, in particular when I was playing park baseball, uh, when I got up to the Babe Ruth League, which for us was age 13 to 15, playing baseball, uh, I, I felt like I was, was getting better, and I felt like I deserved some recognition uh, for, for my ability to play. And the big deal for us um, when you played baseball was if you got to make the all-star team. Uh, you would play the season throughout the season, and then the coaches would get together, and they would select players to play on the All-Star team. And um, and and my 13-year-old year, I was super pumped. I made the All-Star team, and it was great. And I thought, you know what? This is going to be my future from now on out. I'm gonna just I'm gonna play All Stars from here on out. I'm gonna make it. My 14-year-old year came, and I didn't make it. And I started looking at the players that were on the team. You know what? And I started picking them out, and I'm like, well, listen, I'm better than him. Why did he make the team? Oh, he must have made the team because his dad's coaching. That's why he made it. Right or or because you know what his dad his dad uh, you know probably went and lobbied for him to be on the team and and, and maybe his dad had you know a, a business in town that could sponsor them as they went on and that's why it never in my in my thirteen fourteen fifteen year old mind did I go you know what maybe they're just better than me and they were probably no they were right. I, I mean, that's it, right? I, I, how in the world, right? They're just better than I am. But instead, I had to kind of tear them down. Listen, listen, when it comes to, to envy, I'm an Auburn football fan. I get it, right? I get what it's like to look across the state, right? That, that I went to college and I looked across the state and I saw that school in Tuscaloosa, 
And I saw how good they were. It was so incredibly frustrating. It was so, I, could, I couldn't say a good word about it. I still can't say a good word about them, right? Listen, they're, they're an, listen I, I pray, you've heard me say from this platform up here, I hope that every single one of them find Jesus and get to spend eternity in heaven, but I hope they lose every football game they play. I watched, I watched Alabama play football yesterday, not because I like Alabama, but because I'm praying that they lose, right? That's what envy does. It, it rots away inside of you. And you look at other people that have the things that you don't have, and you begin to tear them out. You can't even say something good about them. And it says here that they hated Joseph. Now, uh, Joseph didn't help himself any. Joseph had terrible relational intelligence, right? Look, look at what happens next here in, in, in chapter 37. We're going to kind of pick up with the story where we left off. Verse 5, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. And his brothers said, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of the dream that he said he had. And then he had another dream. He said, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. And when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you all had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, and his father kept the matter in mind. That little word jealous elsewhere throughout the Old Testament is literally translated envious of him. They were envious of him, jealous of him. Now, I just, I don't know much about sibling rivalry, right? I, I, I don't know much about, like, because I, I'm an only child growing up, but I, I do have two daughters in my house. And, and, and I think that just kind of a good rule of thumb would be that if you, if you have a dream like this, you should probably keep it to yourself. But Joseph doesn't do that. He goes and he tells his brothers, hey guys, like they already hate him. And he goes and he says, let me tell you about this dream that I have. And he goes and he tells it to them. Now, in the ancient Near East, um, dreams were an important way that God would communicate to his people. And so this dream meant something and this dream came from God. And so they would have recognized very early on that now not only is their father showing favoritism to Joseph, but now it seems like God is in fact showing favoritism to Joseph as well. And now we have even more reason to hate him and to be envious of him because now it's not just that, uh, it's not enough, right, that our father here is, is, is picked favorites. Now God seems to be picking favorites as well. And you know, I, I don't know about you, but, but oftentimes we find ourselves in situations where we become envious of other people and traits that they didn't necessarily want in and of themselves, but that, that God, in fact, gave to them. This is not anything that's new. Paul, when he was writing uh, to the church in Corinth, he addressed this idea that, that they were kind of competing over these spiritual gifts and, and becoming envious over which gifts were given to which people, and I don't have this type of gift, and you have this kind of gift. And, and at the end of the day, Paul says, you need to understand that God is the one that distributes the gifts to you as he sees fit. And so although they, they really are saying that they're mad with Joseph and they hate Joseph and although they are developing this envy for Joseph, really the person they have a problem with is God because he's the one that's given this gift to Joseph. It, it's, it's like me being upset with someone because they're taller and more athletic than me. 
and, and me being mad at them because of that. Well, it's not their fault that they're taller and more athletic. That was just the gift that God has given them. It's like you being mad at me, right? Because I'm so darn attractive. It's just silly. God blessed me with this, right? You, you see how silly it is, right? You see how goofy it is, right? When we get upset with other people and envious because of gifts that have been given to them by somebody, we're not really upset with them. We're upset with God. Because he's the one that has distributed these gifts to other folks as he sees fit. But if we're not careful, what happens is that envy gets inside of us. And it gives birth to bitterness. And that bitterness will ultimately grow into hatred to where we can't say anything good about anyone else. And if we leave that envy unchecked, it's going to take us to an even more dangerous place. Look what happens next. And we're going to jump down a little bit in the story. Joseph has, has given some bad reports to their father about the brothers and, and, and continues to make some bad decisions. And his brothers are out and they're tending the, the flocks of, um, of, of their father. And Joseph goes out to check on them. And in verse 18, we uh, kind of see what happens next. Genesis chapter 37, verse 18. As Joseph is making his way out to see his brothers. But they saw him in the distance. And before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him to one of these cisterns and say a ferocious animal devoured him. And then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Again, I I don't know anything about sibling rivalry. I've seen my daughters kind of get at each other, right, and try to one-up one another. But never have I heard the conversation that was had between one of my daughters and their friends saying, you know what I need to do with my sister? I need to kill her. Right? At least not one that's been real serious. But, But what happened is envy has rotted away inside of their bones. It's led to hatred. And ultimately that hatred is going to lead to violence. And, and now you may go, now Jeremy, like, you know, I, I've had some bad thoughts about somebody, but I've never thought about murdering them. But, but in reality, right, we may not think about physically taking someone out, but we do kind of relish in their failures, do we not? When, when we see someone that, that, that we're envious of and we see them fall, there's something inside of us, something very primal inside of us maybe, that just kind of is like, yes. Like we, we liked it a little too much when Martha Stewart went to jail. Right? I, I mean, let, let's just be honest, right? Like, I mean, she has like the perfect house, and she knows how to bake all kinds of things, and, and, and she's the one that kind of, kind of ha- you know, she's got like the line of home goods that, you know, you, it just seems to be perfect, and she seems to have everything in order, and when she got convicted of what, what was it, tax fraud or something like that, we were all kind of like, yeah, it's about right, Martha, right? I mean, didn't we love it when Aunt Becky went to jail? Maybe just a little too much? Remember Laurie Laughlin, who played Aunt Becky on Full House? And she paid a university so that her daughter could go to school at University of Southern California. And when she, when she got caught having done that, you're like, you know, I bet all these celebrities are that way. That's how their kids get into school. They're not smart enough to do it. They got to pay them to do it. And you know what? I'm glad she got caught. We kind of relish in the fact that she, she faltered and fell. Or the Chrisleys who had the, 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 the um, uh, real estate business based in Atlanta and here and had their own TV show. They finally get caught and end up having to go to jail. Like when those sorts of things happen, we kind of like, yeah, all right, you know. For me, it's something even more simple than that. It's when Alabama loses a football game. I, I secretly am a little excited about it. 
right? We relish in the fact that when someone falters that has what we want, then, then we kind of go, you know what, inside, if, if we have allowed envy to come in, we go, we really like it when they fall. Because it, envy says it's not just enough for me to have the same thing as you. You have to suffer. In fact, in some ways, what envy will do is it will make you excited if someone doesn't have the thing that they have, even if you don't get it yourself. Because envy wants to tear other people down. Envy, it's not just enough to level the playing field. The people you're envious of, when we allow envy to get in and take root, it will want us to tear each other down. And then, it, 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 if you could only imagine, it gets even worse. Look, look what happens in verse 26. So they're, they're sitting around, and they throw uh, Joseph into a pit, and, and then the story tells us that they sit down to eat lunch. R- wrap your head around that. They've just put their brother in a pit. Their plan is to kill him, but before we kill him, let's not do it on an empty stomach. Let's have lunch, right? And, and, and as they're having lunch, this is what happens. This is Judah, says to his brothers, uh, this is the same Judah, by the way, that from his family would come uh, Jesus Christ, right? Right? Judah said to his brothers, what are we to gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him (laughs) to Egypt. The story will tell us that that, that while Joseph is in the pit and they're having this conversation, which basically amounts to, should we sell him or should we kill him? Should we sell him or should we kill him? That Joseph is pleading for his life. How callous will envy make you? How callous will this sin cause your heart to be that you get to the point where you devalue a human life? So much so that your, your options are to kill them or to sell them and to do it without remorse. It's so much so that Judah says, hey, you know what? If we're going to get rid of him, let's at least get something for ourselves out of it. Let's not just kill him and be done with Joseph. Let's sell him so that, hey, we've got 20 shekels of silver that we can go into town with and get us a Big Mac or whatever it is we want, right? I mean, let's, let's get a little something For ourselves, and the brothers are like, Yeah, let's do that. And what envy will do is, envy will take you to a point where you forget that the people you're talking about, you forget that the people that you want ill will towards are human beings that are made in the image of God, who are loved by Him and have immense worth. You won't even care anymore because they have what you want. You're not going to be happy until they don't have it anymore. Even if it means that they have to falter, they have to fail, and they have to be without. That's the pathway of envy. To bitterness, to anger, to violence, to not even caring anymore that this person matters to God. So so what do we do? How do we combat envy? A couple thousand years later, Paul, who wrote about half the New Testament, he would write about um, an attribute of following Jesus Christ in a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And in the middle of that, verse 4, he makes this statement about love. He says, love does not envy. And so if we want to combat envy, we know that envy breeds violence, but love brings peace. If we want to combat envy in our lives, we've got to figure out how to love and love the way that Jesus loved. We first need to figure out how to love God and love who God made us to be. 
And so the first step is, to, is this love of God and filling our hearts with this love of God because God loves you and has made you exactly the way that he's made you and has given you more than you could ever know. Paul in Ephesians chapter one says this, praise be to the God of our Father and of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And Peter, and Peter, one of the early leaders of the early church, says this in his letter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. I love this verse. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Get this, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. You are God's special possession that have been given every blessing that you need in Christ. He has made you who he has made you as his special possession. He loves you. You are his handy work. And if envy causes us to create our self-worth based on how we compare to others, then what love does is it calls us back to take our self-worth in who God has made us to be and to stop counting the things that we don't have and to start counting our blessings. And so your first step in this is to just take an inventory, maybe even on a regular basis, of the things that God has blessed you with, the gifts he has given you, and the good things that he has poured out in your life. Because if you have anything that is good, it is from him. I, I, I must admit, I am lousy at this. My wife gets on to me all the time. Jody gets on to me all the time because I tend to lean towards the negative. Now, I tend to lean towards all the things that are wrong. That's just kind of how my brain has worked. It's, it's broken beyond repair, right? And, and, and so she's kind of taught me and is teaching me and is hounding me to kind of count my blessings. And I caught myself doing this last night. Last night, uh, I was, we're getting ready for bed, and I'm in the bathroom. Our bathroom's kind of narrow. It's kind of like a big, long galley bathroom. And I'm in this monstrosity of a chair. And I, I don't, you know, so turning around is, is, is difficult. I don't have any shoes and socks on. I'm barefoot because I'm getting ready to crawl in the bed. And as I'm turning my chair around, I just rake my toe between the chair and the, um, and the, the uh, counter underneath my sink. And as I do, I just go, ah! I mean, you know, you've ever done that. You stub your toe, right? I just did it mechanically. And Jody goes, oh, I know that hurt. And without even missing a beat, it wasn't something that I'd planned without even missing a beat, I went, you know what, though? I'm glad I can feel it. Because there's a period of time when I didn't feel it. And there's a period of time where I didn't know if I would ever feel it. And yeah, it, it seems kind of silly, but if we learn how to count our blessings and keep a running list of that, then we come to, to find our self-worth, not in what other people think of us and not in what we don't have, but in how God has poured out his blessing on us. Not only do we need to learn to love God, but we need to learn to love others better. Paul in Romans chapter 12 verse 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. I, I think we do a pretty good job of mourning with those who mourn, but, but sometimes it becomes difficult, especially when envy comes into our lives, to rejoice with those who rejoice, to be excited when God pours out his blessing on someone else, even when we don't have that same blessing. And so we have to learn to celebrate other people and celebrate what God is doing in the life of other people. I, I can remember when I was uh, getting done with seminary, I finished seminary um, in 2004, got my master's in divinity, and, uh, and, and man, I was in a great place professionally. I had three different churches that were wanting to hire me, and, 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 uh, and so I really had to just sit back and pray and pick, and where is it God wants me to go? And, and so I went, and I started serving in my first full-time job, and three years later, 
I took my, my first senior pastor job. I was 29 years old, and I went and took a, a, a church, and I was going to lead this church and its, its, its small little staff that it had, and I was feeling pretty good about myself. Uh, and the same year that I got hired to be a lead, you know, a lead pastor for the first time uh, at 29, uh, David Platt uh, who was just a year older than me, uh, who, um, uh, well, I'll tell you about him in just a minute. David uh, got hired uh, to pastor a mega church in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, that, a church that actually Jody and I attended uh, when we were in college, and he got hired to do that. He was just a year older than me. He, he was already getting ready to, 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 to publish his first book, uh, radical, uh, which came out shortly thereafter. And I, I went and looked at his bio, and not only did he have a master's in divinity degree, uh, but in about roughly the same amount of time that I had been in school, he had gotten his theology master's degree and his PhD in theology all at the same time. And, and let me tell you, it was initially, it was like, man, I was feeling pretty good about myself. And then I look at my boy Dave, right? And I go, man, that, like, he's so much farther along than I am. And, and I began to kind of feel worse about myself and what it was that God was doing inside of my life. And the way that you overcome those moments is you learn to celebrate other people. And you learn to celebrate the victories that God has in their life. So here's the question for you. Who do you need to celebrate? Who's the person in your life that you are looking at and comparing yourself to? And your self-worth is based on how you compare to them rather than who it is that God says that you are. You see, there's enough success and there's enough love and there's enough blessing from God to go around for everyone wouldn't it be great if we would celebrate the successes of others? What if, what if we learn to celebrate the successes of the church down the street? What if we learn to celebrate the successes of our neighbor when they get that business deal that, that, that we had been looking for? Or our coworker when they get the promotion that we felt like we deserved? Or that other student in our class that makes the better grade than us on the test? What if we learn to celebrate them and to love other people? people well who is it that you need to celebrate and maybe the, the next question is just as important what do you need to celebrate what are the things that God has given you what is he doing in your life that you need to thank him for that you need to recognize God this is what it is that you're doing in me for me and I want to celebrate that because if envy breeds violence Love brings peace. The writer of Proverbs would go and put it this way in Proverbs 14, verse 30. A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots its bones. Envy will take you to places that you never wanted to go. It will take you to a place where ultimately you come to devalue other people's lives. Where your self-worth gets so wrapped up in what God is doing in other people that you forget what it is that God is doing in you. And so as we learn to love others, and as we learn to love God and who God has made us to be, who and what do you need to begin to celebrate today? Let me pray for us. God, I, I find myself so guilty of this. It's, it's kind of the, the silent sin. It's, it's one that you keep to yourself and you don't want to, to admit to other folks. But, but God, it is something that can rot us from the inside out if we allow it. God, I, I pray for those of us that are battling with envy right now that we're looking out into the world and we're seeing what other people have to the point where we're feeling so bad about ourselves because our, our self-worth is wrapped up in what it is you're doing in other people rather than what it is that you're doing in us. Father, I, I pray that you would root out envy from our hearts so it wouldn't decay us in such a way that we begin to, to seek uh, the, the, the failure of other people, that we come to seek their demise just so we feel a little bit better about ourselves. 
God, I, I pray that you would remind us of the things that you're doing in our lives. Remind us of, of what it is that you call us and have called us to be and how you've gifted us. And God, I pray that you would help us to celebrate the things you're doing in our lives, the gift that you've given us. And God, I pray that you would help us to recognize those gifts on a regular basis, on a daily basis, that we might celebrate them. And God, I pray that you would help us then to learn how to stop degrading men and women that are made in your image, but instead celebrating what it is you're doing in their life, celebrating their successes, celebrating the gifts that you've poured out on them. And God, I, I think this is such a big deal because when we figure out how to do this, not only do we rid ourselves of the sin of envy, but the world looks at us and begins to wonder what makes us different than everyone else. And then we get to point them to a God that's changed our lives and can change theirs. So God, give us wisdom to know who and what we need to celebrate. And then give us the courage to do it, no matter what it may cost us. We love you, and we trust you even when it's hard. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for coming. I'll see you next week.